that report. <laughs> All right. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the inaugural B Sides Pro Track. Our first speaker this year is Mr. Craig Galley, the Information Security Officer for the City of Jacksonville. He is an IT security professional who's been in the field since 2001 with a BS in Information Science from the University of North Florida. He is a CISP certified. GSIP, GSLC, Security Plus, and many more. Early in his career, Craig was responsible for the deployment and management of network prevention controls in the private sector. His focus shifted to application development with a desire to lead secure coding best practices while chaired on information security steering committees and leading large development projects and teams. Craig currently manages and directs an information security program in the public sector for the city of Jacksonville. Everybody give a warm, Round of applause for Mr. Depp. Really a privilege and an honor to be here for the inaugural B-Sides of Tallahassee. I know it's been a long time coming. And, um, you know, through hurricanes and weather and whatnot, we made it today. So, awesome. March 2nd, 2019. So, I was on the way over from Jacksonville today. I was uh, thinking about a story, um, you know, nerves and stuff like that. Um, kind of where I've been introverted and where I've gone today. And a funny story related to my time in Tallahassee. I went to school here for about two years. But as you know, my bio I finished at UNF. Um, didn't, wasn't quite as focused here in Tallahassee. But uh, anyway, a friend of mine called me in 1995 after I had transferred back to Jacksonville and said, hey, we got this great job for you. Um, you're going to uh, get to go see the Miami Florida State game, and Joe Campbell State, and you can get paid for it, right? I'm thinking, man, wow, this sounds great. So, uh, long story short, we um, got to the stadium and figured out what I was going to be doing. I was going to be following around a camera guy on the sidelines. Easiest job ever, right? And my buddy is up there holding the crap. All he had to do all game was just hold the crap. And I learned that I was going to be the guy following the, uh, the camera up and down the sidelines, right? So, right before the game starts, you know, it's 7 30 at night crowds wild and I'm kind of nervous now that I know that I've got to go back and forth and he, the cameraman says hey we're going to follow up the retiring Deion Sanders member we're going to walk out on the, on the field and I'm like oh my gosh what the heck is going on here so um, long story uh, you know we get going Deion starts walking out and you know you don't really realize the crowd noise you know I've been in plenty of games uh, at uh, Doe Campbell but when you're in the center of it, you're hearing it from all angles, and my knees start to buckle. And somehow, by, by the grace of God, um, you know, I was able to get back up. But man, it was a funny story. Major, major nerves, but a good story nonetheless, and something I wanted to tie uh, to uh, this presentation since we're in Tallahassee. Okay, let's get on to business. So we're going to talk about managing risk in the cloud today. Um, you know. Uh, some of the things we need to watch out for, some of the things you may already be aware of. Um, I'll try to make this as entertaining as possible, and hopefully it'll be a little bit informative as well. So as uh, was mentioned, 18 years involvement in InfoSec. I was a firewall administrator for a large paper company that I believe is still out here in Tallahassee, and um, that has a, has a branch out here, sorry. And so then I kind of evolved and, and went into uh, strict application development after my tenure at that company, right? And so uh, that's when I started to see at Jacksonville, we're in a silo, we're just doing app dev, right? And so I'm thinking, how can I kind of interject security in app dev? And that's what I did for many years, right? So one, uh, another uh, quick story before we get into business. Um, a, a, in about 2005, I, we had to implement a payment system within our uh, building inspections application, right? So I'm like, great, this is going to be encryption of credit card information of the wire, and we're, gonna, we're not going to store sensitive information on the database. This is where I can get back into security, right, and put it into the code. It was, it was perfect, right? So um, we, I think we're told um, six months beforehand this had to happen, and we were just throwing all kinds of hours at it. Finally, we get to the live customer demo. We did tons of tests, I promise you, on my machine up uh, on the second floor of the uh, City Hall Annex in 
Jacksonville, Florida, and we went downstairs to where the building inspection area was and went to this long board table, and we were going to do the demo on somebody else's laptop. Well, this is in 2005. I'm like, how bad can this be, right? I, we've tested it a million times. We get a customer come in for a live demo with their live credit card. We go through the steps. It hits my web service, goes out, and all of a sudden we see a weird screen on this laptop that I've never seen before. It's the worst feeling ever when you're in a live demo, right? And you're working with somebody's credit card number. Um, so, you know, the big, big audience of building inspector, chief building inspector, and uh, customers, and my boss, and my supervisor, all that stuff. And I, you know, the demo failed, like right in the middle, and, and I have no, I don't know what the heck's going on. So I kind of retreated, got the URL that was kind of put in, in or that, that was, it was redirected to. Come to find out that URL was a um, pattern of a virus that, whosoever laptop that was, they, they got it on that laptop, right? And so um, I had to get the, the Wally Eaton, who was the information security officer of the city at the time, they did a full, like, you know, incident response on it. And they said, you, you know, you're right, this thing, it, it didn't have McAfee on it. This is back when um, we were not in the posture we are today. But um, anyway, I say that it, um, that it can happen any time. You've got to be prepared. Um, and that's the last time I ever do a live demo on somebody else's machine. I'll be bringing my own machine. So anyway. Um, so, I have a little bit of a side business that I do, CGE Sec. Um, I'm a ISC2 instructor for CISSP and CSSLP, and I do SANS instructor at the mentor level in Jacksonville. So, um, I've done the MGT 414, which is CISSP prep boot camp, and then also the SEC 3, that should say SEC 401, sorry, my bad on that one, SEC 401, the G set. So um, we'll get we'll talk a little bit about that towards the end of the presentation and what that's all about. So when we talk about cloud services, uh, these are a lot of the you know a lot of the customers that come in and say we well, yeah we need to move this to the cloud we need to move to the cloud. So um, it's usually a, a vendor that's coming in and saying hey this is much better if you go this way. Um, a lot of the uh, pros that are often pitched are low, lower total cost of ownership. Right. A root, uh, this used to say. Um, uh, reduce headcount. Somebody said, you know, you should really tailor that a little softer. So I'm saying reduce salary costs. <laughs> um, higher initial spending versus moderate continuous spending, right? So lots of resources, especially when we're talking about doing any kind of migration that we're already doing something and we're moving it out to the cloud, right? So if it's net new, nah, you know, that, that, that can re be reduced somewhat, but a lot of the stuff that um, I'm seeing and that, that I get involved in, um, it's we're moving something out there that's already that we already have, right? So um, we have to spend a lot of money, but we go, there's meter costs involved and there's lower costs over time, or that's what they say, right? So we haven't really gotten five years down the line to see if there, things are going to get jacked up, right? But moderate continuous spending, what do we have to consider if we keep it on-prem is we've got to refresh our hardware or software um, every five years. So a lot of that kind of gets, um, I guess, transferred if we move to the cloud. So if we have a, you know, a buggy box or a box that, um, you know, it's just been out there for a while and we're at the point where we're making a, a decision to make an, an investment, we may say, you know what, let's just go to the cloud because we know we're probably going to get performance gains because we can, we can go east-west as much as we want, as much as we want to pay for the performance, right? Potentially a higher return on investment. High availability disaster recovery, another um, thing to consider. If you have a, a, a one system, you get a single point of failure. So that's another reason why we would think about going to the cloud. Transfer risk, we just want to transfer that risk altogether. Although we'll see that uh, we won't be able to transfer everything, but, um, and then security. And then I say security, and this, I, I just like putting this up here because, you know, why would, you know, we're going to move to the cloud because it's more secure and that's kind of the essence of this. I guess um, 
it's the same argument, whether it's on-prem or it's in the cloud. We're really not gaining security by going in there. So I love this. It says, lost laptops. This is off of a vendor site, and I've used the, include the URL. Lost laptops are a billion-dollar business problem and potentially greater than the loss of an expensive piece of hardware. It is the loss of the sensitive data inside a cloud. Computing gives you greater security when this happens because your data is stored in the cloud. You can access it no matter what happens to your machine, and you can even remotely wipe the data from lost laptops so it doesn't get in the wrong hands. So that's the only thing that they said about this. They didn't like say, oh, what, what, other, what, what other benefits are, are going to happen? Yeah, the availability data, I get it. That, that, that's there. But um, I think it's a little bit of an oversell on the bullet point of um, why we would consider moving to the cloud. So some key terms, um, the cloud service provider, these are usually our AWS or um, a provider that we are getting a SaaS solution that is already on AWS, and let me include Azure too, so I'm including the big boys, right? Um, the cloud customer, that's usually us, right? A CASB, a cloud access security broker, we'll talk about that on a separate slide so that we can kind of um, uh, talk about that in more depth. And then infrastructure as a service, Platform as a service and software as a service are, are you know, the, the prevalent as a services that are out there, right? And, and you're pro we're probably using SaaS the most, right? Because it's, um, um, we're only responsible for a, a small subset, which we'll see. And then I've added this recently, and this, and this brings in all kinds of um, risk considerations, is your cloud migration vendor or cloud migration services. So this is the, the uh, VAR that's going to come in and say, hey, you're getting ready to make a big purchase and you're getting ready to make a big move to the cloud. Are you sure that you could do it on your own? Because we've done it for this customer, that customer, and this customer. And so, um, you know, we these types of services are out there and they continue to, to grow and we'll talk about some of those concerns that we need to be uh, cognizant of. The cloud security responsibility, right? It's us, it's the cloud customer. We've got to understand what the risks are and, and make good decisions on how to mitigate that risk. We can't transfer the risk of hosting PII data in the cloud. We'll see that's our responsibility in a SaaS. We're ultimately responsible for ensuring that our business requirements are met when utilizing the services in the cloud, right? So yeah, they can, the, the cloud uh, migration partner can kind of help us in that, but we're going to have to sign off on it and we're going to have to get the business involved. We're going to have to basically um, assume that risk that, hey, all that's good as we move into the next phases. So also, as we, um, you know, move stuff out of our data center, possibly, it comes out of our control. Security concer concerns evolve rapidly. Uh, we must understand how this impacts the organization. So once it's out, you really gotta stay on top of it, right? Because you don't have necessarily that data coming through your um, classic firewall or through your security controls that you've uh, you know, fine-tuned and brought into your environment and have everything working kind of nice and alerts and whatnot and also know about those tools, right? We gotta, every time we bring something new in, it's a training class or we have to hire a specialist that knows how to use it. So when we're talking about what do we initially need to consider, what do we need to, to um, really pay attention to, and some of these are what I've studied and some of these are real world um, things that I've come across. The reliability of the cloud service provider Okay, so if they're on AWS and, and they're on uh, Azure, it's probably gonna be pretty reliable, right? But when they when you go out to RFP and they're bringing back the question, they're, they're, they're doing their presentation, are they asking, are you asking the right questions and are, are they answering it like they know what they're doing, right? So um, that's important. Reliability of the cloud migration service. Um, very important to interview um, who they said that they had moved out to the cloud before, right? And, um, you know, make sure that they're communicating what the lessons learned were so those are not a repeat offenses when it comes time for you to go to production, right? Location of the service and data, why is that important? Because um, we may have some um, compliance related uh, concerns where only 
the data can only reside in the continental US, right? And that's important if uh, there's some type of a problem with the cloud service provider or that got hacked and we got to send our legal team up there. Well, we send our legal team to Europe. The color of the law is what is applied in Europe and that stands, right? And if we don't have lawyers that are up to snuff on that, then we're going to have to hire a legal counsel that know what they're doing over in Europe. It's just a lot easier to keep it stateside for those legal purposes. I mean, these are just you know things to, to consider um, as you are looking at where your primary data center is, your backup, and your tertiary uh, data centers are located. Right? Breach reports and history of this cloud service provider. I love this when we get RVs. I you know usually ask them how how are we going to be notified of a breach, and sometimes they'll say, oh yeah, we'll call you immediately, blah blah blah, and then they'll say, but never had a security incident. Okay. okay, I'm sure. Um, and then on top of that, um, I want to know is how I'm going to be notified of your security incidents. And then we'll also um, do like a um, passive reconnaissance on you know news stories or if they had really indeed had some type of a security incident. It may not be the company that had an incident. It could have been the um, the platform that they're using because these these SaaS companies are you, a lot of times they're not using their own infrastructure. They're using Azure and they're um, they're using AWS. Okay, auditors and regulation. Can our auditors go in and audit stuff? Right? Can they get into the audit logs? Because you know it's only a matter of time they're going to come in and, and, and audit you. And hey, I got that report back in 2014. I need that report again. I don't want to leave that the cloud. That's not going to be a happy answer. So these are these are um, things to consider um, as you um, you know again move out or consider moving out. Resource considerations back to the cloud migration uh, vendor, the cloud migration service. Um, I've noticed working with some of these cloud, I'm sorry, the cloud uh, migration services that a lot of their employees were former employees of their last migration partner, their last cloud customer. So we just hired a project manager from X. Wait a second, that person worked at the place they just said they did the cloud migration service. Are they gonna, when we're done with us, who are they gonna take from us? So I'm just kinda, you know, like, that's something that <laughs> I'm adding to the risk of consideration, right? Those migration still going. Exactly, you did such a good job. We noticed, um, would you like to? Right. So, and as you know, uh, SEC pro uh, professionals, well, IT professionals across the board, um, we don't lose them because that's a, a pain in the neck and we don't even need to go into that because we know, right? Vendor lock-in, um, this is a real issue as we'll see uh, on, in the news. When we talk about vendor lock-in, it's, it's really pertinent to your SaaS provider did they write this thing so entrenched with Azure that you're stuck with Azure whether you like it or not because it's going to take them years to get off it? Or is it nimble enough to move? Is it, is it portable enough to move to AWS or whatever your, your favorite uh, hosting provider is? I'm just using the two major ones throughout this presentation. Okay, So that's what vendor lock-in is. And that's just one example, but there's tons of other examples. A well-crafted... Um, service level agreement and a well-crafted contract does a, goes a long way into protecting you against some of these uh, vendor lock-in concerns, okay? So definitely keep that in mind, okay? In the news, so um, we go from vendor lock-in to, and I've, I've included news stories from both, so it doesn't look like I'm picking on one or the other. And these are fairly recent, so this is just last year, right? Amazon's move off of Oracle caused Prime Day outage in one of its biggest warehouses, an internal report says. So it's an internal report. We really don't know what happened. It's just what's <coughs> reported in the news, okay? But it was moving from Oracle DB, so it was them, right? They're saying to our Oracle DB um, as a, in a high level, right? And so you could kind of consider this that Amazon was kind of vendor locked in with Oracle if it wasn't kind of a smooth transition, or maybe they took that into consideration. That's a real world example. And what was the effect? Thousands of delayed deliveries. Well, that's, you know, 
lots of unhappy prime customers, okay? Uh, back in September 2018, um, and this is just kind of how, how things can affect even in the cloud, even how much they say everything is redundant power, redundant this, redundant data centers, redundant staff, 24 hour, 365, 99.99999, right? <laughs> Lightning strike temporarily disabled Microsoft data centers in the South Central US region. South Central? Well, how far east was that? How far west? Well, that's not a whole lot of information, but that's cool. At least if I'm up in the Northeast, eh, okay, next story, next page, right? Or I don't have any concern down there. Anyway, various Office 360, what was the effect? Various Office 365. That's pretty big. Office 365, that's all our email for using the email. That's all our um, OneDrive if we moved uh, our storage out there for our employees, et cetera, et cetera. And then um, various Azure cloud services were also affected with that. All right, moving on to um, the different as a service models and what do we need to be concerned of? What is the what are the responsibilities? So. Um, as the cloud provider, they are completely responsible for the platform, the infrastructure, and the physical. So we don't have to worry about the power. You know, really, the bottom line is this is our lowest risk um, scope, right? We're just responsible for the data. I put um, GRC, which is governance, regulatory, and compliance, right? We need to make sure that our auditors can get in, essentially. But the data, you're not going to get away from, from the risk of the data. You need to make sure your data is encrypted, that only the people that are accessing the, only the people accessing the data are the authorized people. So there's, you know, just because, hey, we're going to the, we're going to the cloud, we're, we're getting a SaaS application, you know, we don't have to worry about that anymore. Wrong, okay? So kind of a shared responsibility is the application. Why? Because, um, the SAS, one of the, when you go to the SAS, you're getting updated whether you like it or not. It's going to go up. It, it's eventually they're going to say, "Hey, um, we're getting ready to update the uh, software to version 10.073, whatever, on April 1st. It's now January 1st. You got 90 days to test this. Have a nice day." Right, and you know, depending on what your contract is, there may be some time that you can buy. And if you're a, a high enough paying customer, I'm sure there's always a, a dollar way out on some things. Some things not right. So security patches, um, stuff that, that that is just emergency patches are always going to happen whether you, whether you're ready or not. But again, you've got to test this, and so that that's why I say shared responsibilities on that. Most most important thing, GRC and data, okay? Moving on to PaaS, Platform as a Service. So cloud providers uh, responsible for the physical infrastructure. Again, we're not worried about the power. We're not worried about the OS so much. This would be um, a situation where we might move some of our databases up, right? Mm -hmm. So it's not so much the SaaS anymore where it would just be an application sitting there that the, that the uh, host provider is doing a I'm sorry, where the, the cloud provider is providing the whole um, the whole thing, the whole um, application experience. This is us, um, you know, involved with uh, SQL, a version of SQL or Oracle or whatever database uh, environment that you want to go to. We're going to have to be involved in patching that and understanding um, how, what the implications are going to be. So, the application I'm talking about is the your database management software. Okay. GRC data, that comes with, with it as well, right? So there's a common denominator on what we are going to be responsible for. Share responsibilities are in the platform, so if they change the OS, you want to make sure that your database management system still works after they make changes to the OS. Okay. Finally, infrastructure as a service, and so this is where we're going to assume the most risk, as you would imagine, right? Because this is where we are um, basically responsible for everything except for the, the physical, the data center, the access into the data center. Um, <clears throat> one thing I didn't manage, or sorry, I didn't mention with this is the people, right? So we don't necessarily have to have the people on site to, to manage uh, this stuff. So uh, that's all concerns with uh, the, the cloud provider. Again, GRC data application. Now the platform, now we're responsible for the OS. Right, and we're responsible for patching the OS. We're 
we may have some shared responsibilities with the infrastructure. We're doing, doing a power uh, test in our data center. We're going to shut it down from uh, data center A and bring it back up on data, data center B. Probably want to test it to make sure that it's still working over on uh, data center B. So continuous monitoring, right? So once we move out, we've got to have the ability to have visibility in what's going on, right? It's not a, a set and forget it. Again, we're not buying security by just migrating out there. We may be buying security as an add-on or to complement what we're moving to the cloud, right? But we, what we want to know is, hey, yeah, you may not have breach when we did our, our engagement, our POC, and we interviewed you, and you did your demo and whatnot, but we'd like to know about the breach and incident notifications before it gets disclosed to the media, because um, that is not happy times when we have to get our, um, you know, our public information office involved after the fact. We, we want to know about that uh, and make an educated decision as soon as possible, right? And a lot of these, you can't take for granted. You got to make sure that, again, they're in your contract or your SLAs, right? Um, centralized logging. So you may have a great SIEM tool, security incident and event man security information and event <coughs> management system. But um, are you going to get that data? How are you going to get that data? That, those types of questions. Because you get it now in your current environment very easily. But um, are, is the, that SaaS provider going to be? forthcoming with that information is your um, is Azure or AWS what do you have to do to get to connect that information right um, and then access to the to the logs we want to make sure that we can provide logs to the auditors this goes back to the government governance regulation and compliance so continuous monitoring is you know, we didn't move and we forgot about it and we make sure that, you know, we have multi-factor authentication and strong passwords and all like that. No, it is just, you know, having the visibility. How do we get the visibility? Um, one way is through a CASB, a Cloud Access Security Broker. We touched on this on, I think, the second or third slide. What is a Cloud Access Security Broker? It's basically a service that is gonna sit in between your provider and the customer and it's gonna kind of give you um, allow you to apply security, your security policies that you have internal to the game, to the, to the cloud game, right? So service between cloud customers and cloud service providers to apply enterprise security policies. Um, CASBs are growing. I mean, it's, it's, there's lots of CASBs out there. Um, two, three years ago, there was probably half, uh, and, and it's just a growing space. The biggest thing that I see now is you don't want two or three CASBs. You really just want one CASB, right? So um, you want a CASB that's got a lot of application connectors, not just one that has the application connectors for your biggest SaaS provider, right? Because what happens is if you go down that road, oh yeah, we can con connect to anything. Oh, that sounds good. And then they say, here's the price for the connector. And you're like, oh my gosh, are you kidding me? So um, those are things that you've got to take into consideration. And I'm not saying just go out and, and scour the web and find the CASB that's got the most connectors. That might not be a wise thing to do either, right? But you have to be cognizant of what connectors they're working on. Oh, we're working on that. Okay, how close are you? Because we're going out here, right? Are you going to meet that? Is it a test? Well, let me get back to you on that. That's usually the question, and you know, it's just means that we're not there yet, right? So you, you've got to make these, you got to make these decisions. You don't want to, so that it, that's where the CASB you choose can be, um, is very important, period. All right, Gar so um, I didn't put a reference here, but I'll say Gartner, 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 because these are the Gartner four pillars, right? Visibility, compliance, data security, and threat prevention. What Gartner says you should, what, what the CASB, is there for why you should use it and what you should ensure your CASB is doing. Visibility, Who, who's using what with the service? So is it an, we want to make sure there's authorized users. You know, that person has the, somehow got that authorization and they're in finance and they're trying to look for something in legal. Ooh, that's a red flag. Let's figure out why, who gave them access to that legal 
uh, and make sure that that was warranted. You know, those are the types of things that you want visibility on, right? Compliance, this goes back to the GRC conversation. You want to make sure that your CASB can provide logs for all of it. Data security, DLP, data leakage prevention, data exfiltration, right? So if we have, again, this goes back to the controls that we have in our environment before we move to the cloud, and we have this wicked DLP that's on the next generation firewall. It's great, it got the regular expressions. We're very low on um, false positives. And all of a sudden we move out. How are we gonna get that um, notification when somebody tries to dump the entire customer table because we don't know they're getting ready to go to another organization? So, that's a big one. Threat protection, uh, automated prevention of unauthorized behavior. So this would be something where we could set up all my uh, field reps will never leave the state of Florida, right? But this CASB has the ability to say, hey, if uh, anything out, outside, the, let's just say outside the U.S. None of our um, uh, sales reps will leave the outside the U.S., but we'll get alerted if foreign IPs try to access this cloud access service. Again, something fairly easy for us to do on, on prem, but um, with a CASB, that is possible. And so um, I'm learning more and more about CASBs as the days go on. And so um, this is definitely in, sir? So, yeah, I mean, I can see where this is more important as you climb that ladder, right? From the infrastructure to the SaaS, because you had touched on it before when you get to the service as uh, our software as a service, you're you have much more obfuscation between you and, and the systems. And that right. Kind of so like you're saying, you don't know if you can get the log or what have you. But, uh, and I can see where, you know, when your uh, employees are accessing this software through this, you can kind of put rules and, and that type of thing. But I mean, it, what keeps people from hacking around your CASB to get to uh, your system? Well, you know, Everything's got a vulnerability, right? There's no, security is not a fill to the, to the roof. So, you know, that's just something that we've got to, CASB is, uh, is if you, it's another as a service, right? Because it's not necessarily on-prem, although it can be, a lot of times it's, it's outside of our uh, environment, but um, we just have to make the best decision on, and make sure we're asking the right questions, make sure that our vendors, um, are taking it seriously, and we're, we're getting you know the, the, the folks that have the CISOs present at the meetings and have the uh, experts that can talk about you know what if what if. But yeah, that, that's all part of the managing risk, and it's not so, this. And I'm glad you brought that up because just putting the CASB in there again is not the that's going to take care of it all, right? It's just a risk re reduction, if nothing more. But that's a great question. I'm glad you brought that up. I should have brought that up on this, Gartner. This does apply um, across all as a services, but it's very, very um, important in the SaaS model um, because you know you're not you're not going to have a whole lot of people going into your infrastructure as a service or your platform as a service. You'll still use indicators to say who's logging in, you'll have privileged privilege access management potentially, but your SaaS potentially, depending on what it is servicing your organization, could include every customer in your organization. And so now you, instead of 100 users, 50 users that you're worried about in, in IAS and PAS, or your service counts that are accessing your databases in your platform as a service, your, your infrastructure as a service, you've got everything involved with uh, a SaaS potentially. And you could make the same argument in the other ones, but I'm just saying, usually, um, like uh, like email, you know, uh, in Office 365, that's potentially everybody in your organization that absolutely needs uh, email. So great question, thanks for bringing that up. One example I, I was gonna say actually was Office 365, just based on experience, having Cisco Ironport on-prem Moving to Office 365, you lost a lot of the services that you would have had, but you know, CASB wasn't considered at that time. But I could certainly see the value of that. Cool. Thanks for bringing that up. Awesome. All right. 
Cloud exposed. So, you know, um, back on our uh, conversation of the vendor saying, yeah, it's more secure to move the cloud. Well, it's the same, uh, I guess what I'm trying to say is, is as, we, as we use these cloud services, the concern is the same, right? And sometimes the concern is um, more heightened. I'm gonna break away from this right now and get away from the PowerPoint, which I'm sure you're uh, ready for at this point. And we're going to bring up Shodan. We have any Shodan IO users? All right, a few, okay, cool. So this will be maybe a um, good experience for some of us. Shodan is basically something that, uh, a tool that takes a lot of the uh, reconnaissance out of the uh, mix for you. You know, it, it'll show a lot of vulnerable hosts and a lot of vulnerable uh, services that hosts may be running. So, and it's easy. I mean, you can go in here and, and I have um, something I'm gonna use as the backup in case we can't find something, but you can search for all kinds of stuff in here, but if we do cloud uh, vulnerability. Okay, good, it's in the cache, beautiful. If I spelt it right, let's see. I don't have it up here, so I apologize. That's why I'm doing the... Um... Okay, so we just did, just, hey, show, show Dan, go out there and search for anything that's marked cloud, and then may have some vulnerabilities. And we got a couple hits, right? So here's one here, Amazon.com. Um, let's click into that one. And, and so it's Amazon.com, and it has this key tag cloud, and I, I'm not sure what that's called, but I'm, I'm guessing it picked up on our... Uh, on our search term, right? Can this search actor be adjusted? Sure. Adjust can we adjust that? Larry. Can we, maybe we can dim, dim the lights a little bit on the front here? Kill the lights over there, please. Focus, have you seen uh, Grey Hat Warfare, the buckets.greyhatwarfare.com, the S3 bucket one? It's like Shodan for Amazon, but it's uh, S3 bucket. Really? Bucket. No, I haven't. I'll go check that out. Yeah, it's awesome. I'll get with you after we are in Jacksonville, so you're yeah. close. You make the Jaguar shirt on. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Is that any better? Is that a little bit better? It's a little bit better. Okay, sorry. It's, it's a little blurry there. The, the font's really tiny. But what we're going to um, see here is, hey, you find some, you, and again, you can search for all kinds of weird stuff on here, so um, user beware, right? Now, I'm not going to bring any of that up because this is being recorded. But anyway, uh, we'll click on this because this is just for informational. And we can, it'll bring up a nice map of where it's located, right in the middle of a river somewhere, cool. Um, so, scroll down, we've got open SSH services. Ah, it's picked up a couple of CVS vulnerabilities here, so we're not gonna, I'm not gonna click on it, I'll show you where you can click, but, and it will take you to a site, but I mean, it's that easy that, that um, you know, folks, Right there. Again, I'm not going to click on it, but I'll take you, if it's live, it'll, sir. Yeah, you might mention that once you click to connect to the vulnerable thing, you may have broken the law, so be very careful with this tool. Exactly. Um, it is not safe in every jurisdiction, but I believe the United States, uh, you're, you're trespassing at that point. Hey, Precisely. sorry, I didn't No, that. no, that's good, that's but good. But I just want people to know that, that tool can get you in trouble. Yes, and precisely why I didn't click it. Yes. And then I'm just showing. Yes, I know you did. <laughs> for the record, for the state. so we're just showing the tool. Again, I'm not showing. And, and um, great comment, and that's that definitely needs to be. Whenever you're doing ethical uh, studies, you definitely need to have permission to hit these um, in certain jurisdictions um, before you do it. So this the the, the purpose of me going here to just tag on all of this was not to show that uh, we can, I guess, that we, we should do it type thing, we shouldn't. It's just, it can be done, right? It's out there. So this could be anybody um, that, that decides to go off to the cloud that didn't take certain things into consideration to uh, protect themselves. So, all right, let's get out of that. Because now I'm scared. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to. No, no, no. I mean, it's great for looking at your own stuff, okay. right? I mean, to scan yourself, see if you have something right. out there. That's the what it's yes, good for for us, right? right. But, but, but just you know, there's, and I'm, I'm sure Shodan now has a warning to let you know when you buy a subscription. But right. right. No, no, no. Let Don't be sorry. Here. That's 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 <laughs> absolutely. That's uh, you know, very important to to point out. 
I, I just wanted to also oh. say that I've also seen where uh, vendors use that tool to, to market uh, you as well if they see vulnerabilities ah. in your system. So they, they use that to kind of say, hey, you got a problem? They didn't even use their own tool that they're saying, hey, subscribe to this. They just went out to show, yeah, I, I believe that. <laughs> All right, sorry. Uh, where are we? I knew I was, okay. Can anybody see which one says start from current slide? Right there, two, more. two to your left. Two to your left. Thank you very much. <laughs> All right, I'm good. All right, so back to the presentation. Um, so in uh, certification that I'm studying for now, um, the, the study of homomorphic encryption um, was present in that, and I really hadn't seen it before. So I just included this in the slide deck to, to say, if you have not seen this, um, it's just something to read up on. It's coming. It's kind of in theory now, but it's basically processing data without it truly being unencrypted, and it's basically uh, computations on top of the encryption that can basically decipher the information as if it was in plain text. So homomorphic encryption, it's something that's that I've read about, and it just kind of, I wanted to say, hey, whoever's in this presentation might want to take a look at it. Interesting stuff. All right, back to um, CSA. Anybody heard of CSA? Cloud Security Alliance. It's essentially the, um, it's a consortium online that is, that their focus is nothing but cloud security. And they've come up with what they call the Treacherous 12. It's kind of similar to the OWASP Top 10 um, Open Web Application Standards Project, Security Project, Security Project, um, Top 10. So. Data breaches, um, credentials and access management, you know, passwords, probably not going to be uh, enough if you um, have super sensitive data out in the cloud and want to uh, get some MFA. Insecure interfaces and APIs. Again, if you just have APIs that are open and you're not doing any kind of auth or you're doing any type of input validation, that could be problematic. System vulnerabilities. So, um, just like what we saw on that one page that shows the, the vulnerabilities, right? So um, we need to be cognizant of if our vendor is patching the vulnerabilities, account hijacking, man in the middle attacks, malicious insiders. So these are, can we, not only the malicious insiders of our organization, could be the malicious insiders of the cloud security provider, right? Or yeah, cloud, um, cloud provider, just the cloud provider. I need to stop drinking coffee. Okay, uh, continuing on, advanced <coughs> system threats, data loss. We talked a little bit about data loss and how that could be bad, and um, we need to consider DLP. Insufficient due diligence. Um, we're just not following it all the way through in our due diligence to ensure that whatever uh, risk analysis we're doing or any type of security controls we're doing um, are effective enough, right? Abuse and nefarious use of cloud services. DOS and shared technology issues. Um, when I when I see shared technology issues, and I and this is one thing that um, that worries me. If I was like if I needed a competitive advantage on somebody, and I started putting data, first of all, I question folks that that will jump right out to the cloud and that have um, the wherewithal and the, and the funding to go to. A, private cloud, right, uh, versus a public cloud. But just let's say for, for um, argument's sake that there's a public cloud out there, we want to move something out there, may have some of our customer data out there. But our competitor happens to be on the same public cloud. There's something um, in cloud security that's called uh, data bleeding, or, um, you know, if, if there's some type of vulnerability that is present on that system, could, our, could we lose our competitive advantage? Right? So that's definitely something we have to be concerned about. Are you ready, right? Are you ready for the cloud? We talked about this having a, a very large staff for cloud migrations, right? We've got the folks that are taking care of the day-to-day -day stuff. Guess what? As you're moving to the cloud, you got all the day-to-day -day stuff still to contend with until you move to the cloud. So 
and then you need some of that staff to figure out what do we need to move to the cloud. So you're talking about lots of overtime, lots of comp time. Um, these are things to take into consideration. In terms of cloud application security, if we have vulnerabilities inside our environment, it should be even more concerning if we're going to just forklift that application and put it up into the cloud, right, into a into a uh, platform as a service. Let's say we just say we're going to move our one of our IS servers out to the cloud and uh, host it on AWS, and we just forklift an application that we didn't do a vulnerability quick vulnerability assessment on. We should be doing continuous vulnerability assessment anyway in our organization, but things get missed, right? But now it's behind your firewall. You may have it blocked and you didn't even know it, right? Now you're moving it out and it's not. So that's kind of where I'm going with that. Vulnerabilities in your environment will move if you migrate, meaning if you do not mitigate them, guess what? It's probably going to be a vulnerability. And I'm not talking about unpatched stuff. I'm talking about more of the um, application type vulnerabilities. Ask me how I know. I can't tell you. Um, Long-term concerns, retention policies. Yeah, retention policies. How long do you have to keep that data out there? And is it going to, you know, um, oh, it's unlimited data. You move as much data. I see that changing down the line at some point. So you're going to have to, if, if you keep everything, you may want to start thinking about a retention policy um, for numerous reasons, right? If you have it and you don't need it, that's bad. If you don't need it, get rid of it because if you get sued and there's a data um, request, uh, what's it called? Uh, yeah. E-discovery, right? Somebody said it, right? E-discovery, guess what? You're probably going to have to, or, 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 or there's some type of uh, investigation, you're going to have to provide it, or you didn't even need to hold it, right? So um, that's, that's an overall thing, but certainly in cloud also. What's our app strategy, right? Uh, did we consider vendor lock-in? Data remnants afterwards, um, after we move, if we move, is the data still out there? We want to ensure that the data is being disposed of properly. Crypto shredding, basically applying cryptographic um, methods on the data to warrant what completely useless, right? And then destroying the keys, like, um, I don't know. It's like a, a, it's an endless cycle, right, on how we're, we're deleting stuff, right? But and then compliance, um, do we have the right retention years? Are we storing three years, but we really need to store six years? So there's the other end of that spectrum. So kind of in summary here, this is the, I got a couple more slides here, but in summary, we're, we're saying that the cloud customer is always responsible for governance, regulatory and compliance, right? And the data. The cloud services offer many advertised cost benefits. Risk is present in many forms throughout cloud models. We as information security pro professionals must be involved to voice the risk, right? We are communicating the risk. We, and if we're not doing that, then we're really not doing our jobs. But, and if, but if you're not at the table, that's another problem, right? So seek to get, if, if you're in a position where you can lobby that, I highly, um, recommend that, right? But at the end of the day, we're, we're voicing the risk and senior management and C-levels and board members weigh the cost benefits, cost benefits versus the risk and make decision based on their risk appetite, right? So I'm going to go right into uh, education opportunities. If this stuff interests you and you want to get certified in it, I mentioned I'm studying for one of the certifications. Um, there's a Cloud Security Association. I said Cloud Security Association. I thought I said Cloud Security Alliance. If I said that, I'm, I mixed those up. Sorry. Um, CCK, CCSK certification, and then IC Square um, has the CCSP. Both uh, very good certifications if you kind of want to uh, profess knowledge in that. If you don't know about cyber.it, um, you might want to check that out. That's a pretty darn good site, um, both for certification prep and all other kinds of things. Um, they have a lot of security stuff out there. So um, two years ago, Neat Trip, if you, if you like crypto, I, I've heard some folks that are some of the volunteers, they go to DEF CON and they go to uh, Black Hat. I myself have not gone to any of those. I really, that's why I really like these events, because these are ones that I can attend. 
Um, but I took a trip with my daughter up in the Northeast to kind of show the homeland of New Jersey, which is my home uh, state. And on the way up, I said, we're going to the uh, Cryptographic Museum, which is outside of the NSA, right? And it's a really cool place for geeks and for kids. So this is an Enigma machine where she did a uh, encrypting on one Enigma machine, went over to another one and decrypted. Okay, this is, was like the encryption for yeah. World War II Germany. And they have the actual machines there, they're not replicas. And you can, you know. So it's, it's uber cool um, if you're a uh, cyber geek, which I'm sure everybody here is. So if you're in the area, it's way out in the northeast. It's, it's right outside NSA. So I didn't spend a lot of time at this light because like, I didn't want to call it. But I was just like doing one of these. And so I got a quick picture of that. And I think that's a communication desk uh, for one of the um, NASA locations, I can't remember. But anyway, it's a cool place. I highly recommend it. OK, so I mentioned I'm an instructor. I don't have a um, SEC 401. That's, that's the right class. Security Essentials Boot Camp style. Uh, it's really not a boot camp because we don't do it in a full week. But we do it um, like two nights a week or one night a week so we can customize it. I, basic, I primarily teach this in Jacksonville. We're going to have a class to be determined. Um, and we typically do it over seven weeks. However, if, you're, if your organization is interested in the MGT 414 or the SEC 401 in a weak environment that you would like to do just for your company and maybe another company, let me know. We can tailor a schedule for you. So that's enough of my um, promotion. I do want to let you, this is kind of a, another uh, promotion, but not for me. This is for uh, you, and if you're interested in attending a really good day of training, um, it's called the IT Pro Camp in Jacksonville. It's going to be on June 1st. It's going to be at Kaiser University. I, I noticed that Kaiser is one of the sponsors here, so, so that's good. So it's going to be heavy security, but there are other um, spaces as well. This is an excellent opportunity if um, you're new to technology or you're in school and you want to get some certs, there's going to be a, a free Lean Six Sigma, if that interests you, on the project management side. Um, there's going to be a, a host uh, or a handful of other Microsoft MCT style certifications that'll be free. And there'll be a lot of good presenters from the Jacksonville area that'll be professing knowledge. At the same token, if you're interested in presenting, if you're an expert in, or, or you want to present something, um, and, and you're highly skilled in that area, let, let us know, okay? The, the site is um, itpro.camp, but if you just Google IT Pro Camp, you'll find it. There's a, ma'am. June 1st is, a, what day is that? I believe it's on a Saturday, it's unfortunately. A Saturday. Fortunately or unfortunately, right? Uh, Saturday <laughs> in the summer, it's kind of a burn, but hey, um, you know, vacation in Jacksonville over the weekend, bring the family, and then you get to go to a, a tech conference, right? So anyway, any questions on that, I'm happy to answer it. That's my last slide. That's my contact information. If you want to reach out to me, LinkedIn, that's, I tweet very, a little bit, I guess the most tweets I've done a long time for was the, for this event today. So anyway, that's it. Any questions? What's our rate for? I'm studying for the um, Certified Cloud Security Professional. Yeah, so, um, and if you are studying for that or you're interested in that, I want to, I'm glad you, you mentioned that. They are changing the curriculum in August of 2000, of this year. So, if you can cram and you want to take it, take it now, but don't study for it. And if you schedule the test, um, make sure you schedule it before August, that's all I'm going to say. <laughs> you don't want to be on the old. Thank you very much. It's been a long <laughs>